And welcome everyone to episode 201. Hi, Esther. Hi, Florian. 201. Heading strongly towards 300 soon. So we're going to hit 300 when? In 20, in like mid 2026? Depends. Yeah, depends on the pace, but uh, probably next mid 2025. Yeah, then it's just going to be our AI avatars doing this. <laughs> you know, we throw, we, throw, we throw some bullet points in the podcast machine. And then, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, you and me talking, natural voice. Nobody will, uh, will notice. No one will notice, no. Until then, we shall be unpacking our just released language service provider index um, manually still with actual brains and not NVIDIA delivered GPUs. Then uh, just take a quick look at Language AI. We just uh, launched a new briefing, Language AI briefing, the first edition in February 2024. Uh, then we're also going to talk about TransPerfect's new co-CEO. So there's a new co-CEO at the world's largest LSP. And then you're going to tell us a bit more about M&A. Uh, strong start to the year. We have Powerlang, Yonkers, Oclaro, Blend, all coming with transactions. Now, really excited about our upcoming Slatercon Remote conference. We have Marcia Fadai as a key speaker she's uh, the senior research scientist at cohere and you know cohere basically you know top four or five ai companies i think they're in in kind of discussions now to raise another half a billion to a billion according to reuters i just checked this morning and so marcia was going to talk about aya which is cohere's new massively multilingual data set and language model they released just a few days ago you know, she's going to talk about why multilingual systems matter, challenges and gains of building the largest data set for multilingual instruction tuning, how you train something like this. I think it covers like 101 languages, Aya. And then just, yeah, building the foundations of like an open science initiative and, and some of the lessons learned. So really, really uh, happy that Marcia uh, takes the time to, to speak to us uh, at SlaterCon Remote. That's going to be, that's going to be great. Also, don't forget to join us at SlaterCon London, the IRL version, the in-person version. We're still um, at the early bird stage, but not for much longer. Tickets are selling quickly. You know, we got the fantastic location with the Nobu Hotel there in the heart of, of London. I think, did you visit briefly? Did you do like location scouting or? Yeah, I, I did visit a while back and, and the networking event also. Yes, uh, it's going to be good. Looking forward to that in May. So get your ticket now. All right, so let's head into the what we call LSPI, that's jargon for Language Service Provider Index. And, you know, we've been busy over the past couple of weeks, even more than that, maybe past couple of months, putting this together. And it's only Feb 22nd and it's already out. And this is basically revenue data for how many? How many LSPs that participated in this? 250 so far. And we keep updating, so we're probably going to hit about 300. So thanks to the 250 companies who are so quick in doing their books so they can already give you their accounts or their, you know, top line data by February 22nd. Uh, that's, uh, you know, looks like a lot of these LSPs have their accounting in order. So, yeah, walk us through this kind of key findings, just remind us again of the structure and some of the terms we're using for these different tiers and brackets. Yeah, so 2024 LSPI, I think it's our seventh or something edition uh, that we've been putting out for, for many years now. Um, so the format will be quite familiar to, to lots of people. If you have a look on the website, you can browse and see all of the 250 LSPs that have participated in the index. Um, we, as most years, break down uh, the index into four different categories. So based on the revenue size, um, typically of the LSPs, uh, we have the category super agencies. And so these are the um, so LSPs with revenues of more than 200 million US dollars that are also full service and standalone. So these are your TransPerfects, your RWSs, your We Localizers, et cetera, of uh, Linebridge, of course, of, um, of the world. Then we have uh, another category, which is the leaders category. And these are LSPs with revenues above two, uh, 25 million US dollars and those that um, don't qualify for the super agency status for, for other reasons. Um, 
challenges. So these are LSPs with revenues between 8 million and 25 million US dollars. And then boutiques with revenues between 1 and 8 million. So we, we have to cut it off somewhere. Um, you know, we can't include absolutely every single translation uh, localization agency in the world. Uh, so we do maintain a cutoff uh, threshold of $1 million in annual revenues. Um, so yeah, 250 companies participated across those, those four categories. We also supplemented the index with another 50 to 60 uh, companies that who haven't managed yet uh, to probably finalize uh, their books from last year, um, but they did participate and they typically participate um, in the LSPI. They participated last year, so we have their previous year's revenues um, that are known to us. Um, so yeah, overall, so including those that were still kind of waiting to, to receive the updated figures, there were eight super agencies around 50 leaders, around 50 challengers, um, and nearly 200 boutique LSPs. Um, so it's a, a very rich list uh, when it comes to doing analysis and diving into um, what's been going on um, in terms of 2023 growth or otherwise. Or otherwise. That was a bit of the theme here, right? The otherwise. I mean, this was probably the most difficult year so far since we started the index in 2018? I'd say so, yeah. I mean, we we always caveat sort of whatever analysis we do, we always kind of caveat um, the, the growth figure to say, well, obviously that also includes M&A driven growth. Um, so, you know, the overall percentage by which companies grew on a revenue basis is not, is, is, is not reflective well, not totally reflective of, of underlying um, organic growth in the market. Um, so, you know, we did have this year a higher percentage of companies that reported revenue declines versus 2022. And that was definitely a strong theme coming out of the, the index. Um, and overall, a lower growth percentage across uh, the 250 companies than we have seen in previous years. Yeah, and then I mean, some some of the companies that probably have extreme pronounced declines or just don't like to share, and if when their revenue declines, probably didn't even participate, right? So there's even a bit of a kind of a sample bias there. But interesting that we had like over forty percent of the super agency, thirty percent leaders, you know, twenty percent challengers, and forty five percent boutiques reporting declining revenues. Again, I think we we checked briefly, and this is probably the, the the most pronounced decline we had since you know we started this, which kind of speaks to that challenging year, which was kind of a double whammy of some kind of macroeconomic pressure, then the whole AI hype, which kind of led to a lot of the very senior people maybe questioning some of the the spend, right, putting pressure on. Uh, the lock and translation managers to just do more in-house. Uh, and that, that's what I'm also hearing anecdotally from, from people, from leaders of businesses, that just some, some of the, the kind of pure text volume is just being pulled more in-house and, and they're, they're trying to do more with just kind of their, their own tech that they may be building or that, that's coming out. We wanted this more core machine translation providers, not so much yet like that volumes go into like open AI or any of these fancy new AI solutions, but more like just to the kind of core MT providers, right? No, I was gonna say, I would also say kudos to those companies that did experience declines, but still participated, because I think it's testament to the fact that, you know, this is a meaningful look at the industry. I mean, it is important that we get participation in order um, to, to be able to provide a benchmark um, in terms of what's happening in the industry. That also means though that more than half of the companies that did participate managed to grow. So it's not like all dark and gloomy. We haven't analyzed to the extent to which companies have, the, the ones who have declined, declined. So we're not saying if a company declined in revenue, they, they lost 50% of their revenues. You know, this could be like minus one, minus 2%. Um, so on that level, yeah, so it's not like in the boutiques they had a forty-five percent drop in revenue. It's that you know a good like a forty-five percent of the ones that participated had a drop of some description. Yeah, it could be two percent, could be one percent, could be thirty percent. Um, but I mean, it will take time. Obviously, we only released the index yesterday. It will take time to do some of some of that analysis um, and bring you a bit more around that. Who was top one, two, three? Let's did we. Did you find that out already? Did you have a chance? Because we only got this out yesterday. So, 
I mean, not not extremely reliably, I would say. Um, we not, What we normally do when we talk about the fastest growing is look at the percentage growth um, and then also an, analyze on the basis of US dollar growth um, so as not to overly bias the small ones or overly bias the, the larger ones. Um, but we do tend to not include companies that are, or not talk about companies that are sort of one to two million when we're talking about uh, extreme growth. Um, but yeah, we pulled out a couple of um, leaders in particular um, that had uh, strong growth in 2023. So one that um, stood out was Elan. Um, um, that one grew so this is in within the leader category. Grew, um, I mean, more than doubled um, to revenues of around 60 million in 2023. Um, if you've been following our coverage over the past year. Plus, um, you'd have seen that they did quite a lot of um, acquisitions in 2023. Um, so probably unsurprisingly that they've managed to add quite a lot to their top line there. And I'm sure supported by some organic growth as well. Um, another one um, that's pretty fast growing was DA Languages in the UK. Another leader growing to around um, 48 million US dollars. Um, and then looking at the super agencies, um, n none of them had fast the f among the f top growing from a percentage level. Um, obviously, it's harder to grow a, a fast percentage wise when you're already very, very sizable. Um, but among the super agencies, keywords um, seems to have performed best in a percentage growth terms with nearly 13 percent um, forecast growth. Still, I think they haven't come up with their, their final figures, but forecast growth of about 13 percent. And there, if we unpack it, I think the localization business actually didn't grow much or at all. I guess it's many of these other game services that they're offering. But yeah, we need to look at how much of that is actually localization related. You're right. All right. So one super agency that did manage to grow 3% is TransPerfect, our friends over in New York. And they announced you know, a week ago that they appointed Qin Li as the new co-CEO. Uh, so sharing the CEO ship with you know, founder and current CEO, Phil Shaw. So interesting career kind of speaks to how that company works as well. I mean, Jin Lee has been with the company for 20 years, worked in initially in the New York office, now is based in the Atlanta office. He started working at TransPerfect in 2003 as a project manager, shortly after graduating from Middlebury College, you know, that kind of famous localization, um, a program there. So yeah, project manager, Esther, rising to the top. I'm forever in favor of the uh, project managers. Yeah. And so basically he was initially in charge of the Asian language production team and then later joined the legal and patent translations team. So he really knows the business inside out. I mean, if you're, if you're starting out in PM, you go into production, obviously, you know, when you get to that level, you also had a lot of exposure to sales and, and, and other, other aspects of the business. But yeah, so he, he is, he must know every nook and cranny of this company quite well. Now, uh, now we also ask, um, uh, what the responsibilities are going to be in this co CEO ship. So naturally he, uh, Chin Lee is going to take, you know, production focus on company ops and production and Phil Shaw will spend more time on tech sales and, and M and A. I mean, you know, Phil Shaw is, uh, very passionate about sales. You remember having him at uh, one of our Slatercon conferences, kind of laying out the the sales process, which TransPerfect so famous for. So many uh, salespeople, probably more than any any other LSP in the industry. So, congrats to Jin Lee, and uh, you know all the best for co CEO ship there. We I just briefly mentioned it. I want to mention it, but we launched a new series for our subscribers called Language AI Briefing, and uh, we collate a bunch of stories. There's just so much out there. So like. We started it because, I mean, we're trying to kind of breathless, breathlessly cover all these uh, advances in, you know, broadest bucket language AI and kind of try to position them um, in, in a relevant way for, for the language industry, language services and tech industry. And so this AI briefing really gives you a nice selection of what's happening within one month that, you know, you want to be aware of. So, for example, in MT, we flagged a few stories there, like the Amazon um, thing, research paper, where they kind of looked at how much content on the internet is web scraped, machine translated data that's then ingested into LLMs. Um, so kind of a garbage in, garbage out situation. Um, we also uh, featured the Unbobble's new uh, model, multilingual LLM 
that is translate translation related sorry it's optimized for translation related tasks and it's called tower the tower of unbubble so and then a couple others uh, we also have like stories uh, where we kind of list things in text generation highlights in speech technology uh, for example, Akola launched like an AI powered voice solution. So you're starting to see that some of these big LSPs are starting to also launch tech solutions because they can and they should, right? They have development talent in-house and, and why should you leave that field wide open to all these startups building on some kind of, you know, somebody else's API if you can do it yourself. Um, yeah, so really interesting series and uh, looking forward to seeing uh, the next edition there as well. Speaking of scrappy startups, um, that are building on on AI. You want to check out this story that Alex has written, uh, and the title is "Building a Functional AI Dubbing App Has Become Vanilla." So what happened there is that this startup called Sync Labs that focuses only on the lip sync aspect of a um, well of what do you call it like video. Video syncing, what, what dubbing? Video syncing or video dubbing, or just the sync, sync, uh, the lip sync aspect. Basically, put a how to there. So, how can you build a functional AI dubbing app? Because if you, I mean, this is one of the obviously most natural use cases for having a lip sync functionality. So, Sync Labs only does the lip sync, but then if people don't know how to build on top of that or use that app, then you know it's they're going to struggle to scale. So he, it's interesting. They put like this, um, this really this detailed how to on GitHub for anybody to check out. So go, go to that article, check it out. It's very, very interesting. Uh, what type of tech they use. They use like Gladia, something called Gladia for transcription and translation, 11 labs for voice cloning and speech synthesis. And, and then of course their own, yeah, sync labs for lip sync videos. So very, very interesting. And you see how kind of yeah, vanilla, how plain this has gotten. Like you can just build this and, you know, now good luck commercializing it. But um, but the tech, the tech's there now. Yeah, tech's there. I mean, maybe not you. Depends on who, who you're talking to when you say you. I mean, one can with the right skills, right? Spin up something but like this. But it's not heavy. You don't think so? A couple of engineers? Maybe, but it's a lot of API. It's just kind of mushing this together. So, you know, again, I'm not a tech person. I can't code, but seems somewhat straightforward if, if i understand what they built then i can't i mean I, I can't believe it's too complicated to actually build something like that again the, the challenge is in the commercialization so you got that thing well how do you get people to subscribe use it and then kind of scale up because it's also expensive it was interesting that um in the demo version they built they actually uh, had to remove the 11 labs api because i think people started using the demo version and then very quickly started the costs for 11 for the 11 labs um component of it started to spiral out of control for, so they had to kind of stop that functionality so yeah it's uh you know these llm things are not cheap yeah it's like it's cool but then what do we do with it you know or like you say how do we scale it how do we how do we sell it if it costs you $20 to do like 10 minutes of video lip sync, then well, I mean, good luck trying to sell that to somebody. All right, let's go back to more familiar shores where we feel very comfortable. Let's talk about merges and acquisitions among language, service, and tech providers. Yeah, well, we, I think in our last pod, we discussed a few uh, transactions that had happened in January. Um, and yeah, generally quite a strong start to 2024. Um, with regards to mergers and acquisitions. Um, so one uh, that we tracked in late January was Powerling in France acquiring WCS Group. Um, so this was, um, yeah, France-based Powerling acquiring uh, what was a troubled WCS Group in the Netherlands after WCS Group had filed for bankruptcy. Um, so Powerling actually alerted us it, was this the thing we had to cut from the last podcast? Because it like yeah. during the time we recorded that li li that those twenty four hours something happened. That's the one. Yeah, that is the one. Um, yeah, they Powerling got in touch and said, "Oh, we've acquired WCS Group." So naturally, we didn't want to focus on the fact that WCS Group um, had filed for bankruptcy, but rather the fact um, that Powerling acquired WCS Group. And our last 
Well, just uh, we talked about WCS Group going bankrupt, and then in the 24 hours that it took us to produce, then Powerlink swooped in and bought them. That's right. Yeah, and told us about it, which we're, we're grateful for <laughs> that they that they alerted us to that fact. Um, yeah, so I mean, interesting acquisition there. Obviously, a very speedy acquisition there as well. Um, we had some comment from Annette uh, Vanderloos, the co-founder and COO of Powerling, um, explaining a bit about why they thought it was a great idea to acquire WCS Group. They said, uh, she said, being a major actor in the Netherlands has always been part of Powerling history, um, and that they admired the quality um, of work of the WCS team. So, good luck to. Uh, the uh the two of them all right and then and then a merger between two healthy parties yeah mergers which we don't um, typically see a huge amount of in the language industry um, but we had a merger announced in early fe february between uh, belgian-based yonkers and us-based aclaro um, this merger is effective from the first of february um, probably, I mean, these will be familiar names, I think, for many, many of our listeners. Yonkers was uh, founded in 1994. Uh, Aclaro founded 2002, uh, actually by Michael Critz, who's still the company's CEO. Yonkers, uh, we've covered them a, a fair bit the past year. They were sold, um, majority sold to private equity firm Mayfair uh, early in 2023. Um, so, yeah, two already established uh, leaders in their own right if we're going back to the LSPI terminology um, both of a similar size uh, I think based on last year's revenue sort of around 30 35 ish million US dollars each um, so yeah kind of a considerable player now cross Atlantic as well um, sort of fully US Europe um, leader um, that we have in the combined organization there. Um, Silke Schweigert, who's the Yonkers CEO, um, is now becoming the group CEO of the company. And Michael Kritz is uh, staying on as CEO of Aclaro. Um, Michael also gave some comment about the merger saying, yep, similar size and shared values between the two companies. Um, the merger allows the companies to expand investments, um, both in sort of the areas of AI, people, tech and service offerings. So yeah, best of luck to them also. And one that just came in yesterday. Yeah, one came in less uh, yesterday. I think we published um, also on the 21st of, of February um, was Blend's acquisition of uh, Manpower Language Solutions. So both companies there being based um, in, in Israel. Um, Blend acquired uh, the company um, known as MLS. MLS was founded... A while back in 1992, uh, it was formerly owned actually by Manpower Group Israel. Um, the company works for public sector agencies, Israeli businesses, and um, sort of doing global helping global brands access uh, the Israeli market. The CEO of MLS has now retired, but the rest of the team, uh, the rest of the leadership team, are going to be staying on with Blend. Um, and then Yair, the CEO of Blend, said to us, uh, the plan moving forward is going to be to maintain the MLS brand at least for a few months and then integrate it into Blend later in the year. All right. And I think Benny Orr helped facilitate the deal, if I read our piece correct. So quick shout out, Benny Orr. Congrats. All right. That was it for today. Quick news check-in. So again, make sure to register for SlaterCon Remote. Make sure to res register for SlaterCon London and go and read through our LSPI, 250 companies presented to you in one very user-friendly, um, you know, interactive database, I guess, freely available. All right, talk soon.